Now, our next guest, he's coming up on 100 Ireland appearances. He has 200 Munster appearances on the way very shortly. Keith Earls at 34, still going strong. And with the help of Tommy Conlon, he has put pen to paper on his autobiography. And it's a brilliant one at that. It's called Fight or Flight. I'll hold it up for you here. My life, my choices. Uh, Keith Earls, you're very welcome. Great to have you on. Cheers. Thanks for having me, John. It's taken plenty of fight on several fronts. Your career, reading this book, that becomes very obvious. So I get the name. A lot of fight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I suppose my my whole life, really, since I was twelve, was was a fight, and I suppose at times the the rugby didn't help with it either. You know. Listen, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. So I'll just jump straight in, and we'll see where it takes us. Let's start with Moy Ross for a second, because Moy Ross is just such a constant part of the book and part of your story. You do stress, and you do stress in the book, that most of the time, Moy Ross was pretty normal. So I don't want to give the wrong impression here, but there are certain instances where you get an insight into how, well, your background is very different from my background and lots of other people's backgrounds. Like certain stories jump to mind from the book where you're a kid and you're in the back garden and you hear some bangs out the front and you run out and there's a dude in a balaclava firing shots at lads running down the road. And the next morning when your poor dad's getting up to go to work, he finds a bullet in the engine of his uh, new van for work. So uh, these kind of things, those more unusual kind of things had an effect on you, I guess. How could they not? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, as you said there, it was it was obviously the the hardest chapter to do the the my Ross and me you know it was a a delicate chapter for for me to write obviously because i'm proud of where i'm from and i didn't want to annoy any people from my ross because i i still like driving through there heading out to my parents um but yeah like you know i think my my struggles at the time you know the the, the height of the the troubles in limerick you know i I would have got a lot, a lot of anxiety from it, and um, you know, just that that scenario that you describe of put your man the the balaclava and and the gunshot. So it was it was hard not to have any bit of anxiety or or any bit of worry, you know. So and you you try and numb it out, but you know, it's it's tough. It's, it's a lot of stuff we've seen was you know you you see it on films, but as I said, it it wasn't all the time, you know. I've, I've, I've had a great childhood growing up on my Ross, you know, and, you know, my Ross has definitely shaped me to, to the man I am uh, today. And, you know, 95% of the time it was, um, it was a great community to, to live in. You know, we were well looked after, neighbours looked after us, like great friends. You know, we, we did a lot of facilities, you know, the community centre, you know, we had handball alleys, we had soccer pitches. So there's plenty to keep us busy as well. And, you know, thankfully I had I had the sport to keep me busy and, you know, a lot of fellas I did know went down the wrong route, you know. And that love for the place comes across as well. So for anyone who hasn't read it, it's anything but a hatchet job or anything approaching that on Moy Ross. I would stress that as well. I'm sure you're keen to because I can imagine it's delicate. Like you make the point as well. So whatever anxiety may be the word that that environment induced at times it's not like it was talked about all that much well you know different times and so it's not like everyone your parents were necessarily sitting down and saying let's talk about this and maybe should there be counseling if you see certain things you don't want to see there, there was a degree probably in ireland let alone moira Ross. there was a degree at that time of just like we'll say nothing and get on with it a bit you know yeah exactly there was there was no mention of you know emotions or, or mental health back then um, in a way, you know, things be like them scenarios became quite normal to us. Um, obviously, it got to a stage where I got into my teens where when my father obviously got uh, extremely paranoid, and you know, he was he was on high alert constantly, and I could, I could, I I could feel that fear off him. You know, he was he was very worried about, me. and and the same with my mother as well. Mm. You know, and I've I've said in the book he's he's often drove. Up to, I'd be up meeting Adele or my buddies, or I'd be playing soccer, and he often drove up to to make me change my clothes because he he might have seen um you know a certain person wear the same hoodie as me, or you know he was he was just he was just unbelievably paranoid about it, and 
and rightly so, you know, there's a story about me being being chased home. You know, that was um that was quite worrying as well. So yeah, I could I could feel the, the fear off him, but he just, you know, we, we didn't really speak about it. He could just tell me, you know, he'd be careful, but I, I could I could feel it off my parents how much um how much fear they had about it as well. Yeah, hoodies and baseball caps he was not a fan of because there could be cases of mistaken identity and that story you re- referenced there about being chased home is uh, one of them. Yeah, I guess an early kind of sign of maybe some of the difficulties you'd have later on. You said there were kind of lots of deaths in your circle, I suppose, in your teenage years, suicides, cancer, drownings, violence, and you got to a point where you had rosary beads, I think, for every person who had passed. And there was almost a, a daily or nightly ritual with the beads. I mean, it sounds almost a touch OCD or something. So uh, you say in that paragraph, Adele, your now wife, remembers you've been very deep for a young fella. So you know, it's kind of a funny way of putting it. But it's it's not funny in other ways. Like you were, is a coping mechanism, I, I, I suppose, is what it is when you take a step back and look at it. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, as you said, a, a lot of tragedies growing up and I suppose a lot of them superstitions, you know, just built up through the years that I had to do certain things to to feel safe or, you know, I I'd, I don't mention it in the book, but I'd superstition where I couldn't turn off the telly unless it was not turned on to number three, you know, mad things like that. And I'd often be in bed and I'd be like, oh, my God, the telly is not number three. And I think bad things were going to happen to me. Um, you know, and that was the downward spiral. I, I was getting into it. There was always, it was getting worse and it was getting worse. And, you know, I, I couldn't travel in the car without uh, rosary beads. You know, I had a cousin who, had, who died in a, a car accident and we'd be traveling up and down to Cork. And I was just in in fear, fear. like, you know, all these things were happening to me yeah. and I just, I just couldn't get them out of my head. And, um, you know, my... My grandparents went to Lords, and you know it's a big thing with with the with the Irish um, grandmothers, and yeah. they bring back the rosier beads, and yeah, the just mortuary cards. You know, it was it was quite tough. It was tough. I didn't know how to deal with the loss of um, the family members or or the loss of of people I knew within the community. Um, you know, a lot of tragedies. Yeah. Do you remember thinking at the time? Because obviously. You can look back now and see, well, that's not the healthiest of behavior. Do you remember thinking at the time with the stuff like channels got to be a number three or the rosary beads? Man, this is not right. Like, I don't think any of my friends are caught up with this stuff. Or maybe that doesn't occur to you when you're young and it's the only kind of life you've known. But do you remember thinking there's something off with me here, even at that age? Yeah, I do. And like, I hope he doesn't mind me saying, but I think my father kind of, you know, with his paranoia, he he would have done a lot of stuff like that. He had a lot of superstitions, and if I'm living around it, you know, your your habits are gonna become who you're around and, and what you're around. And I suppose he he didn't, you know, it wasn't spoke about in his era either about the the emotions and, and mental health. And maybe he didn't. Well, he didn't have the education that it was probably rubbing off on me. And mm. yeah, I definitely knew it wasn't right, but. You know, I was I was going along with it no matter what, like, you know. Yeah. Well, again, to stress, the upsides of Moy Ross are all over the book. Like there's such a love there for Moy Ross and the values it gives you have clearly stood to you. Like there's a story much later on in the book, right? <laughs> I just had a chuckle out loud. So if you can picture the scene, Keith Earls is finally a centrally contracted player. He's always wanted a Range Rover. I mean, for the love of God, let the man treat himself once. And so, look, takes the Range Rover out for a test drive. And this is feeling good. I think we're on to a winner here and swings home. Dad, what do you think? And uh, well, you were told in fairly no uncertain terms, there's absolutely no chance you're keeping that, <laughs> that Range Rover. I just thought that was great. Like that, that would keep you on the straight and narrow. Yeah, you know, and uh, it's- you know, that was definitely at home, keeping humble. And yeah, I, I thought I was the man. I was 21. I was going off in my Range Rover. And he just told me, you know, you know what you can do with that now is bring it right back. And I went away and I bought a, a Toyota Vensus instead. Nice, a nice humble car. But I think in general, Limerick people will always keep you, keep you humble, you know. So I wasn't going to get too far ahead, ahead of myself. Um, 
living in Limerick. You've um, been, I think, like celebrated. I don't know how much you're paying attention to the media at the moment, but there's so much love for you. Even we saw on the text machine, text machine, I sound like I'm a hundred, on the text messages coming in and uh, on Twitter and everything. You know, the last couple of weeks, anytime we mention some of the quotes on our chats, just there's such a love for you out there. And so I, I knew to expect the mental health discussion in the book. What I hadn't banked on, and I think you deserve so much credit for bringing this up, because this would be a very easy one for you to say, nah, let's let's just keep that in the background, was you talk about your issues with literacy. So school, not a big point of emphasis growing up. You hang on in there to do your leaving cert, but that's as much about rugby as anything. Um, on the day of your leaving cert biology exam, sure, you duck out of that and go off swimming with your mates. I mean, not many people skip a leave insert exam. And I guess for a large part of your 20s and, and however long, like you reckon there's probably undiagnosed dyslexia there. And so, I mean, there's terror. Jeez, I just feel sorry for you at a certain point. You, you talk about signing an autograph and you realize like afterwards you misspelled wishes. You put an extra H in wishes and come out in a cold sweat. Um, that's a that's a kind of tough thing to talk about and admit and like I, I can imagine that must have popped up in your life in all these places I would just take for granted where it wouldn't pop up in my life at all and I thought it was it was amazing that you talked about that but that can't can't have been easy at all no it's it wasn't and and yeah I, I still plan on going and getting tested so I'm I definitely definitely have a touch of dy dyslexia and even since writing the book um you know, I kept three books for my my three little girls, and I, I I I'm putting them away for them to read when they're older. But even writing, I wrote a little piece for for the three of them last week, and I even spelled LMA's name wrong. I put I put E A L L A, you know, and and she and she noticed it. Right. She said it to me. So, and even during the pandemic, trying to do the homework with them. Like it was, it was so embarrassing. So embarrassing, and you know, it it is a, t a tough thing to to talk about. But I accept it. I'm not frightened to ask. You know how how to spell something. I I didn't know how to to post a letter. You know what way to write an address. Um, didn't know where to put the stamp. You know, he looking at me with with two heads. You know, and you know, my biggest thing there is, I suppose, was I wasn't frightened to to ask for help, but. Mm. You know, I had, I had, I have embarrassed myself a, a couple of times throughout the years, and even more recently. And you know, when Andy Farrell first took over, you know, the story in the book, mm. um, he's asking me what have I plans after rugby, and I said, look, I'm a small bit worried about it because you know, like, I can't, like, I don't read well, I, I don't write well, like, I don't spell well, and you know, he. He said he knew many people who went on to be successful. You know, you 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 always you, you go in, you you try and learn, and you can pick it up fairly handy. But uh, a couple of weeks later, we ended up having a spelling competition in camp, backs against forwards, and I was sitting on the front, and I was like, oh "God, Simon, don't don't pick me." Simon yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. I I knew I knew I wasn't going to get up, and I, I wasn't going to be embarrassed. And lo and behold, he picks me and. You know, I, was, I felt really vulnerable and I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not mm. stepping up. And, and like, you're not allowed to say no in those moments. Yeah, exactly. You know, the lads are all there, get up early and in fairness to Andy, he stood up and he goes, not in a, he wasn't undermining me, but he was just like, early doesn't do spelling competitions and, and that was it. And mm. Simon even came up and apologised to me, but I said, look, there's, you know, I've, I've nearly accepted, accepted, accepting has been a big part of my life. Right. And um, you know, how is how is he to know? But you know, it is it is something I I'm I'm still struggling with, and I certainly have to to get it looked at. Yeah, I guarantee you a lot of people hearing that will be, will just feel a lot better hearing that. I thought I just thought that was an amazing thing of you to talk about. I really did. Uh, let's talk some rugby for a second. So um, I was always so curious. Sorry, at this. <laughs> This is like the most miserable line of questioning ever. I apologize, right? But um, bear with me. I was always so curious about the Leinster of 09. I knew when this book came out, I was like, I'm, I'm looking forward to that chapter in a grim sort of a way. Sorry, but I, I was because I was really into that tour. I, I you know, watched every minute of it. I just, I just for whatever reason, that one really caught me. And 
I vividly remember the Royal 15 in Rustenburg. And like sometimes players say, oh, I didn't have a bad game. And actually it turns out you weren't as bad as you thought. You genuinely, you genuinely were. Like it was really bad. You just couldn't catch a ball. There was something so obviously off with you because of the talent that was there. Um, and you say stage fright, being almost unable for the global attention. You talked about being mortified for your family back home. But what, what jumped out to me was you said it took me years to get over it. Carried mental scars for six, seven years. So, um, yeah, that tour. <laughs> do you reflect on it like with great regret or in some ways is it not the making of you but it's such a learning curve or or how, how does it sit into your career for you you know i've said it a few times it's probably the, the best thing and the worst thing to happen to right. me you know and right yeah because like from professional rugby all my rugby career really you know everything had been playing sailing you know it was great like no mistakes i was scoring tries and man of the match performances and even coming into Munster my first season or two it was it was all great and the Lions tour was the first time I've, I've really had a bad game and as I said it was at the on the world stage I remember like looking at the jersey it was like this is absolutely insane you know like three years ago I was in I was I was in sixth year in, in school and you know the, the lads when you're doing your yearbook and I remember there was a writing under my picture, you know, upon leaving school, Keith hopes to marry his childhood sweetheart, but also go on the 2000, the next Lions tour. Yeah. You know, and it was funny at the time. And then when it was happening, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is ridiculous. And yeah, the looking at the jersey and I remember walking out with that game, walking behind Paul O'Connell as he was captain. I was like, this is absolutely insane. You know, yeah. was, I've only realized what it was the last couple of couple of months really was like it was like an imposter syndrome you know i didn't didn't feel i deserved to be there i just didn't feel like reality to me and i just wanted to be at home and i knew all my parents my parents were at home in in tome and clubhouse watching the game jesus as you said it was an absolute nightmare and you know that's when i first came across media i was actually going out there for the wrong reasons to prove people wrong that I deserve to be on the tour rather than just going out and enjoy the experience you know a certain reporter wrote bad things about me before it and I, I tried to go out and prove him wrong really wrong. rather than going yeah. out and enjoy and, but when I, I proved him right <laughs> <laughs> um, to, yeah. to, be, to be fair because I remember you picked up an injury in that tour I didn't realise or I had just forgotten that actually to be fair to you you rallied okay when you came back because in the end you played five games you did score two tries i know there was no test cap but actually maybe the memory of that first game dwarfs the fact that you did okay in the end it it seemed like you came home yeah it did you know. it did yeah it, it dwarfed it all right and i yeah. remember the second game against the cheetahs i couldn't catch the ball in a warm-up i was like what is going on in my brain you know i just, just couldn't get hold of it and then settle down score a try and then Gradually, as you said, built into the tour. Um, you know, I still made one or two little mistakes, you know, against the emerging spring box. I just I just couldn't get for some reason I couldn't get the, the blitz defense in, into my head, you know, Sean Edwards defense, and you know, it was it was just a tough thing. And I suppose the other side of it, I probably didn't do enough um preparation myself to to get better. I thought talent alone was enough and that, that tour was a rude awakening. The backdrop to much of your career, obviously, is your issues with mental health, which you talk about. And I just couldn't recommend people to read the chapters enough. Firstly, because of how brilliantly the book teases out what it was like for you. But secondly, your road to recovery, you know, particularly 16, 17 onwards is just uh, fantastic. So like you say, for instance, Darren Sutherland's passing was a bit of a wake up call for you. God, I need to do something here. You, you, there's a sentence where you talk about how so much of your time you felt empty and feeling worthless inside. And I always remember, you know, a lot of the players at the 2011 World Cup loved it. Great time. And, you know, you hated it, you know, and you, you were conscious. God, my career is passing me by here. I want to just, you know, not be away from home. And it, it's funny, the, the anecdotes actually 
in some ways explain the condition best. Like Dunica O'Callan's wedding in 2009, where you've been, you know, a, a little bit a part of Munster winning a European Cup and a little bit a part of the Grand Slam. And you've got to think life's good and there's great times ahead. And you're going to his wedding and uh, you hit some traffic on the way that Christmas. And you said you went from, your mood goes from zero to a hundred in frustration and anger in no time want to turn around don't even want to go to the wedding anymore don't want people to see me i was like wow geez okay moments moments like that that was the a part of the fight in your head yeah it was um you know and there have been many like my mood could just go like that for yeah. for any reason you know that was just one little story yeah but yeah darren sutherland um that really really hit home with me you know he's when you think about how successful he was and you know, I think he was, he was living in London on his own and, you know, pursuing his, his career in, in boxing after a, a bronze medal at the Olympics, a massive achievement. And that, and that was all nine. I was sitting at home. Edel was at work and, you know, I'd been, I'd been curious. Well, I had a lot of time, you know, back then we were, we could be in at, you know, at nine o'clock and we could be finished by half ten. And Edel yeah. wouldn't come home till six. So I had like all them hours to myself and, you know, I, thoughts were coming into my head because I, I, you know, I had, as I said, we spoke about the tra tragedies um, you know, and even then in 09, I, I still kept it for another four years, you know, um, and I could just, I could just feel myself. I was just getting deeper and deeper and deeper every year. The, and they were ha happening more often, my mood swings and my emptiness, you know, it, it nearly became my, my default. Right. The, the, the odd day of, of happiness and trying to hide it became exhausting and Joe, Joe Schmidt took over in 2013 I was in one of his camps and I just called the doctor up to the room and I felt and I said I need I need I need help you know I I'm in Irish camp I'm in Carton House you know I'm I'm um, I, I have a child at home everything should be brilliant but you know, I'm living, I'm living in hell in, in my, my internal thoughts. And thankfully, he, you know, I got help. I went and seen a, seen a psychiatrist in, in Cork and I wouldn't leave his office until he gave me a, a pill. You know, first of all, he diagnosed me with, with bipolar and he said, look, let's go off and see how you are for the next couple of weeks. And I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not leaving your office. I'm, I don't want to go back out and un, unless you can fix me. And, you know, in a way, the, the pill, you know, obviously being prescribed medication, it was, um, I was delighted to get it. But then as I was starting to research, you know, over the couple of years, I was like, I felt bad. I felt ashamed of taking medication for, for a mental health. And I went off it, you know, cold turkey. And um, Edel was kind of, I told Norman about it and Edel was starting to, asked me questions she 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 says herself she could see it in my eyes she could see i was i was changing and you know and uh, that tour in Ar to argentina in 2014 i was supposed to go on i was trying to get out of a, a rut and i ended up i suppose going on a, a bit of a bender you know trying to get a bit of happiness yeah. and get the worst thing ever you can do is come off medication cold turkey and go drinking you know and following day i just woke up and you know i was i was in tears and we were due to go on tour two days later and i was like maybe this is just a bad hangover <laughs> but it wasn't you know i was this was another cry for for help and i eventually broke down to and told her i came off medication rang the doctor spoke to joe schmidt and you know he told me look get yourself right that's the, the most important thing because even 2015 World Cup, famous win over France. Everyone remembers. So this is two years after the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so that morning, that game and that aftermath sounds horrific. Horrific. Like none of us had any idea where you were, really. Yeah. None yeah. of us had a clue where you were. Your memory of that day? Yeah, that, even, that, even that week, you know, I... We playing against Romania and Canada, and it was it was ground we were winning, and you know I was, I was playing I was playing quite well, 
and then Joel, even myself and Ian Henderson, I remember there was obviously the media was kicking up for us. The two of us were, were going well and we'd been, we'd been rested for the French game. Um, so Jared Payne was in at 13. I'd been playing a bit of wing and, and 13 and Jared Payne got injured and on the Thursday ended up slotting into 13. And I had, I had prepared, but it, it just triggered a lot of anxiety. It was just a change, like, you know, and I didn't deal with it well. Like the sickness in the pit of my stomach with nerves and even Edel meet me that morning. She goes, what is like, I was sweating. I was white as a ghost and didn't want to be there. I just, I literally would have easily taken a flight a flight home back to, to Shannon and, and stayed in Limerick and never to be <laughs> never be seen again. Yeah. And I kind of mani manifested all these, you know, bad scenarios that, you know, you didn't think, didn't never thought I was good enough. And, you know, always thinking the worst that I was going to make a mistake. And I did make a big mistake in that game. You know, Tommy Bowen made a beautiful break and I, I knocked on the ball and, Everything I was thinking was was happening, and it was, it was all it was all bad stuff. And I, I was genuinely in a I was in mm. a a brutal place. I, I can't describe it. Yeah, because you mentioned tears before the game, trembling, and then you say, and it was the line. I don't know. It's just one of those lines in the book where I thought, God, where after the game you go back into the cubicle, cursing just everything with frustration, like just why me? Like what the hell is this? And then the sentence in the book is, then I went back out and I showered and joined the lads and pretended nothing was wrong. Yeah, yeah. I remember straight in, I even had kind of tears in my eyes walking around the, the pitch. I was like, I felt like crap. Like, you know, and we went into the dressing room, straight into the cubicle. The boys were outside cheering. You know, it was an unbelievable win. Like, yeah. like hammer, hammered France. And I was inside, uh, effing and blood. I couldn't figure out why. Like, you know, how I was feeling so bad and I, I had enough of it. I, you know, how all my teammates were, you know, they had an unbelievable tournaments and, you know. Best days of their lives, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, wiped away the tears and, and, and went back out and, you know, had a beer. And even though I was internally in a, in a dark place. It's amazing you were able to play rugby at all, really, around then, isn't it? Yeah, because I wasn't getting any release from you know it was it was it was it was driving me it was worse it was adding to, to all my anxiety and all my my worthless feelings you know and um, yeah I just you know I just I just cracked on with it um, you know it was tough seven days of the week it was it was tough and then the physical side of things was taking its toll as well so yeah I I don't know how. How I got through it, really. The road to, I suppose, real recovery and really feeling better from 16, 17 on is it's an inspirational read, I found. And I, geez, I just, I was kind of, I knew obviously everything worked out. We're kind of willing you on as you, as you were discovering things along with the medication, to be fair, but you were discovering things like positive self talk and getting up and saying, today's going to be a good day. I'm going to do my best to make it a good day. Uh, discovering gluten-free diet and how god jesus i feel i feel great for it and things like gratitude lists and journaling every night and you know you're you're, you're reading and you're discovering like i guess the fancy word is neuroplasticity like that the brain's a muscle and i'm going to re rewire my brain and i'll we'll chat about keith barry maybe in a minute but but all of these things around that time you seem to get a bit of momentum almost for the first time i felt in your life with your mental health like Jesus, this is actually we're we're moving here in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, and I had I had gone through a lot of things, you know, different, you know, fads, but it was all it was all trying trying to get better mentally, you know, and you know, thankfully, you know, I started to find these things. I I started to find even my identity outside, you know, becoming a father and and what I wanted to achieve there. Yeah, the and just experiment them really, you know, trial and error with everything and, you know, preparation, you know, with, regarding rugby, regarding traveling, just regarding normal day, really. Um, 
pre- pre- the preparation and, and getting organized was was massive for me. And, you know, I finally, finally found my routine in life with with a lot of them, um, you know, the gratitude list, the, the self-talk, mm. you know, after. And it took a good it took a good three years. I probably could have done it faster, but it took a good three years to finally um you know, feel that it was, it was, my thoughts were eventually changing because right. I was, as you said, I was willing, I was willing to do anything to, to, to start feeling better again. And uh, trust me, I, I, I tried everything as well. <laughs> yeah, no, it comes across. Uh, Keith Barry, didn't know that had been going on. So um, he wasn't hypnotizing you or anything. Like yeah. that. Uh, I guess he made, he tailored a visualization type tape for you and 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 geez like you were committed to it i think you said for instance 2018 grand slam year your players player of the year that year everyone remembers your catch in france or your your chase back against italy or just your general performances uh you were doing maybe half an hour visualization a day you, you might give us a sense of that you'd a bit of relaxation you'd almost envisage walking down into a cinema room yeah yeah like like i said I, a lot of good sports psychologists over the years obviously but something, something struck with me with with keith um you know he taught me how to visualize he taught me how to breathe he taught me how to to relax and yeah it's he came in and spoke we used to have um you know different people come in and speak to us and do q and a's and you know keith keith says um i hope he doesn't mind me saying his own kind of tragedies in life and you know he as you said, yeah, he's he's the hypnotist, you know, he's he's a lot of party pieces, but he's he's a he's a life coach as well. And he's he's experimented and he's went and he's he's looked at the brain. And I was even convinced that I could wire my brain anyway from the way Joe Schmidt spoke about, you know, the famous the mind gym. So I approached Keith Barry, you know, I was like, I need I need to change. And mm. you know, he was great for my rugby side of things. Um, you know, in Carton House, he'd go up to my bedroom and he'd, he'd help me, he'd teach me how to relax, how to breathe, how to, to visualize myself. And, you know, without, without being cheesy, it was, it, was, it was absolutely scary how these things were working out for me. I'd visualize them and, and, they, and they, uh, they were happening. And yeah. even one or two of the lads, you know, I'd, I'd goals that year, I'd wrote down, I'd visualize getting player of the year, I'd visualize... You know, getting player of the year from Munster and Ireland, visualize the last ditch tackles, you know, visualize big moments and go through mistakes as well and repair them when I was visualizing. So when it happened in the game, I wasn't panicking. I was like, yes. right, we've kind of been here before. And, you know, I'd say, I'm sure if you can curse, I'd say, F it every time I made a mistake and you move on because there's genuinely nothing you can do about it. Um, whereas I would have been stuck that negative thought um in the previous years yeah well i mean you even mentioned in in literally during games in previous years the negativity was so bad the sense of doom so bad the anxiety so bad that you're even saying to yourself during games you're shit you're going to drop the next ball you know yeah. this this was the the self-talk so that's that's night and day or even you know the kid who had no tools going out to south africa on that line story we talked about versus 2018 say for instance and like I had no sense whatsoever of how serious the issues were behind the scenes. However, as an onlooker and just, I was a big fan of yours and and really wanted you to do well. I saw such a change. Even I could see such a change in you late twenties in that period, like in terms of your body language, this level of assurance, this sense of being your own man. And you had done, I remembered like little interviews here and there where you'd mentioned the rosary beads and the superstitions and Ken Egan had come in and kind of put you right in that. So I definitely had a sense that Cheesy was finding himself. I didn't know what was going on, but but I, I, I could see, God, he's really just kind of a little bit bulletproof in that period of his career. So if I noticed that, your teammates must have noticed a change. So like, how open were you with your teammates? Like, were you sneaking Keith Barry up the back door into the hotel room? I mean, how at, at this stage, so you talked to Joe Schmidt about your problems did the dressing room know at any stage what the reality was? Did the dressing room know bipolar? Did they know any of that ever? No, no, they didn't bar one or two. Obviously, you know, Paul O'Connell had a massive influence in, in my life. I, I knew him since I was 12 years of age. You know, I would have spoke to him. 
Right. I would have spoke to Raj. I would have mentioned it to, to Conor Murray, but I, I only come out and told the, the senior players in Munster last year, we had a meeting that, that I was bipolar. Wow. And they were like, Jesus Christ. Go away. Um, that idea was your, was that meeting your idea? Yeah, it was because we had a young squad and we kind of got together, so you know, how, how, we, how we can help other lads and how we can make them better and how we, you know, we were trying to, find our own standards our own identity as, as monster and i just said lads i can't do it. i wake up every morning and i'm in a fight i'm wondering what who's going to wake who's woken up is it hank or is it keith and you know it's, i suppose it was a, i get great satisfaction out of helping people but but the, whatever that year i just i just felt i couldn't you know i needed to concentrate on, on myself so I just I came out and said it to them and they were like, Jesus Christ, fair play, Joe. That's unbelievable. This is exactly what we need. We need fellas to 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 be honest. And I suppose a, a lot of things made sense to them as well that <laughs> how much of an oddball I was. <laughs> and did you do something similar with Ireland or no? No, no, I didn't. Like, you know, the interview in the late late was probably the, the first time any I did lads um I would be close to Johnny Sexton, even, you know, holidays together. And I don't think he, he even knew, you know, bar, bar the, the late, late show. And, you know, the amount of the lads have come up to me and said it was un- unbelievable. Um, you know, because I, I was, and that's the stigma we have to kill. I was, I was a, bit, uh, a bit ashamed and I was a bit embarrassed. Are the lads going to think differently of me? But I suppose the side of my, my growth is, that I'm, I'm showing my vulnerable size, but you know I'm, I'm I'm taking it on as well, you know, and you can get great confidence from that. Were you a nervous wreck ahead of that late late show interview? Yeah, yeah, geez, uh, like uh, it was actually funny. I was I was supposed to go on and do a pre-record on the late late because and then because of COVID protocols, I actually couldn't do it because I was coming into camp. Mm. I was actually upstairs in the RT, and right. Ryan was was down. But I remember being up there and I was like, this is it, people are going to, they're going to know the, the real me now. And, you know, it was kind of a bit of a guilt for, for, for lying to people, you know. Sure. Um, but there have been nothing but unbelievable um, support from everyone yeah. and people texting, parents texting saying their kid opened up immediately. Wow. Even some ex players and still present players went and 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 spoke to people and 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 that's what I wanted from the book, complete mm. honesty and you know even if I helped one person, I, I would have been delighted with it. How did you feel when Ryan said, "Okay, Keith, thanks very much. We'll leave it there and interview over." Did you feel, "Yeah, good. This is. I'm glad I've done that. That's a weight off." No, I didn't. I felt it was a Wednesday. I felt unbelievably nervous. And then I had two days to wait oh, then before it, it came out. Right. Um, Sorry. I thought it was live. OK, yeah. so you have, you have the long wait. And so yeah. did you watch it on the Friday? No, no. And I still haven't watched it. OK. Did you, you get know, um, and did your, your phone blows up? My phone blow. I, I went to bed. Edel, Edel stayed up and watched it. Um, I just, what, what, did you, what did she say about it? Yeah, she, she came in. I was in bed. We were playing Connacht the the following night and um, she came into bed and she just gave me a big hug and she said that was that was unbelievable and even the amount of text she had got and she just said I'm so proud of you um wow brilliant you know and she said my my phone went went berserk I couldn't look for it I probably still haven't replied to to a lot of people um yeah but yeah as as the weeks have gone on now I'm I'm feeling a bit more comfortable I, I suppose I feel but I do feel feel proud that it's it is definitely I'm not saying I've I've won the well, I suppose I have I've won the battle, but um you know the the war is still going on. <laughs> yeah. Well look, you certainly haven't lost the battle, that's for sure. You you said in the concluding chapter of the book that, you know, at this stage of your of your fight with it, to use the title of the book, that obviously this still arises. This is not, you know, everything's happy clappy. So it might be a day or two a month, those bad days, but those day or two, they, they don't turn into a week. They don't turn into a sustained dark period. You've, 
you've equipped yourself with tools, I suppose, which is which is where you are now. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, life life couldn't be any better, and you know, I, I, and I'm not, and you know, I'm probably not going to speak too much, but I don't, I don't want people to think I'm a preacher of this positive talk. Um, I just want to see, you know, I just want to get the message across. Genuinely, you, no one knows how Barry, Barry Dell, how how bad I was, and. To see where I am now is that's the kind of story I want to get across to people. No matter how bad your situation is, I'm telling you, you 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 can get out of it. You know, with with the right help. And if the main thing is you you want to get the help yourself. You know, you you want to accept to yourself that you you want to change. And if you have that drive, you can change. Mm. Have you shook off the you used the word ashamed or embarrassed of you? Shaking that off, and um, just just about it. Maybe that's just who I am as well. Like, I suppose the, the little bit of paranoia creeps in every now and then. You know what? Yeah. When people are looking at me or what way they judging me or you know, oh, but that, so I can't do anything about that. You know, and that's one of the tools that I have now is is acceptance in life. And you know, life is tough. You know, you accept that and. There's going to be good days and there's going to be bad days and you know you have to be equipped for it oh well listen if you've seen the reaction oh, i mean you'd be i know you have to accept if it's good or bad and that's that's you can't be judged by other people but like it's been incredible i've listened to so many people talk about you in the last week somebody uh, made the argument and i thought god that's bloody true it might have been donald lennon i don't know who anyway but they were saying actually you know far from this fella having like a mental frailty he's been like mentally the strongest most resilient player probably of the last 15 years in Irish rugby to have had the career he's had given what was going on it's actually about mental strength as much as anything which I thought was a a great way of putting it you know for the rest of your life now you're going to have people coming up to you and people who probably surprise you and they'll say oh look I have my issues too guaranteed for the rest of your life you'll have and you'll be met you know you'll, you'll be probably blown away by the amount of people who come up and say god yeah look something similar myself you know yeah well well hope hopefully that happens you know hopefully um people will start start talking about it and yeah um yeah i suppose in a way as well i'm i do i do every now and then when you know i do see a comment or people do come up talk to me i do get the you know, a, a, a small bit emotional, and it's and it's emotional because of you know how 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 bad I was, and yeah, you know what way people I suppose do it, admire me now for coming out speaking about. It. Listen, let's move. Let, let's touch on rugby to to wrap up because I've taken enough of your time. I I had planned to talk to you about your body. I don't have time, but like Jesus, it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> the not being able to breathe thing during the best three years of rugby of your life lung capacity yeah. at 50 percent because your liver is putting pressure on your lungs like that was hard to believe with i guess i remember that chase back against italy you think of france and paris and the dying minutes and the catch and it actually doesn't make any sense whatsoever so um how's your body now like you like are you are you anywhere close to 100 percent these days yeah no it's 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 great that's that's worlds apart as well, you know, and it's amazing with an issue that put me to retirement. You're going into my coach and telling them I retire and um, you know, with a piece, piece of tape, it being able to fix it. <laughs> you know, literally, it's it's generally like a, a car set going out um, playing a match. Um, you know, so is, your, is your liver still floating around a bit out of place? Yeah, like it's loose. It goes into place. It goes out. Oh, this, this is what they, they presume is wrong um with me and and since we've 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 sorted that you know i've i do flare up every now and then um right. i do go into a bit of spasm but you know we you know it's not just one thing delivers the issue and obviously you know i've i've had you know whatever 15 seasons 16 mm. seasons that the body is it's just as I'm getting older as well, you know, a neck, a neck, a neck issue is set off the back, the back sits off the hip, the hip sets off the knee, you know, and it's, it's constant uh, maintenance and, 
you know, for a long time we were, we were chasing so many different things, but I think, you know, we've we finally found a routine now when it does flare up, it might only last a day or two. Um, but, you know, it's this season is just all about, I'm feeling good and it's about getting game time. I've only played one and a half games, really, nice. you know, because I did have a, a, a bad flare up again at the, at the start of the season. It was probably the long flare up. 2020 you know so um yeah look it's it's an ongoing thing but it's definitely you know might have one bad day in the month you know physically as well great i it was so interesting to read your chapter on speed because just by the age profile of the i guess the generation which has gone before you the story of their careers is generally uh like for the first five six years we were on the piss a lot and you know, messing around and weren't the best of professionals, but then sort of sorted ourselves out and, and had a great career. Uh, this amazing thing with you, whereby you're as fast now at 34 as you were at 20. And one of the reasons is Tom Cummins in the University of Limerick, an international sprinter. So like you're you're a kid. He's looking for some guinea pigs for his thesis, broadly speaking, on sprinting. And so from the age of, I don't know, 1920, as a kid, basically, you learn about form alignment mechanics correct weights for explosiveness how to practice your speed how to maintain your speed and uh, you reckon from the age of 1920 to 34 it's still there yeah and you know i i used to, i used to go in to tom at six and seven in the morning before school so i was even younger than 90 wow. you know i was 16 17 and yeah it's it's it definitely i can I can put a lot of my credit to to Tom for for my speed. Um, you know, as you said he's he was a, a national sprinter himself. He'd been to the Olympics, and thankfully the the guinea pig was was me because some of the lads, you know, still struggle with speed, technique, and being able to repeat. And even though it might look a bit ridiculous, you know, form and and being able to keep repeated is is massive because if you're if you're not running properly you, you know you're going to get tired faster so yeah i was i was blessed to, to have a lot of that work done in you know my my late teens early 20s and as i got a bit older then you know injuries started to creak in i wasn't being able to to do a lot of weights but the foundation was 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 there with tom and you know thankfully i haven't i haven't lost um i need the speed awfully <laughs> you uh have played with some great irish players I was very interested to see you, you you stuck your neck out and you said best player i've played with johnny sexton yeah i've 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 played i'd say alongside raj you know brian driscoll uh, paulie um, connor murray in the last couple of years but you know when you look and you see what what johnny Johnny has achieved it. It has been phenomenal, and the competitor, the competitor he is, and how he actually runs the team is is unbelievable. And now he's, you know, he's he's probably come through his own battles. Never spoke about it. You know, he would have been, you know, a kick here and there, but to come back and and win some of the games and some of the moments he's had for for Leinster and. and um, and Ireland and how much he puts his his body on the line and the work he does off the field to be the you know one of the best players in the world you mm. know four hunting cups you know six nations grand slams australia tour you know lines tour world player of the year you know so it's it's hard, it's hard to to argue with that i'm i'm sure raj won't be too happy but raj raj isn't far off you know the list or Two obviously different players, but yeah, Johnny has been. Um, you know, I first played with him in two thousand and seven, and in the whole way up, he's you know he's he's been incredible. Didn't realize you were a teacher's pet at Joe Schmidt either. That was kind of interesting to discover. I maybe because you confided in him, he was aware yeah. of that. And but um, seems like geez, you, you loved a life under him. You, you said he ruled through excellence, and like if people say he was intimidating or anything. He was intimidating because of his of the knowledge he had and you know the stuff we've heard about Schmidt before you mentioned it was like he could see into the future times so you can't you love that period really under Joe Schmidt 
Yeah, I did. And, you know, a lot of people said he would have he would have caught through fear. And, you know, I know a lot of lads would have been quite stressed um, playing, playing under Joe. And at times I was stressed as well. But, you know, I just had, I genuinely had so much faith in him and I, I believed in his philosophy. And I, you know, a big part of my success is Joe helped me prepare. Like Joe, Joe was just unbe unbelievable at that. You know, demand an excellence um, every time, and probably, you know, probably didn't take the foot off the pedal when we weren't on the field as well. A lot of fellas, but you know, he doesn't get a lot of credit. He he genuinely did have a brilliant sense of humour. I got on really well with him. I used to, I used to slag him. He used to slag me, um, and I'm not sure. You you know maybe because of my mental health issues that he didn't criticize me too much, but I had so much respect for him. I didn't want to leave him down. I rarely, you know, I knew all my detail, you know, training, you know, I was always flying it in training and in games, you know, I remember there was a, a game in, in Japan in 2017, Luke McGrath put up, it was genuinely, it couldn't have been a better box kick and I chased it and I lost it in the sun. Yeah. And it hit me in the back of the head and Joe blamed the kick. You know, it was, it was kind of embarrassing. <laughs> I was like, Jesus, Joe, this is the boys. Too are, far, too far. Yeah, the, the boys are going to give me a, a slag in here. But, you know, I know a lot of players have come out and spoke about him recently. But, you know, when you look at it, he, he caused through excellence. And, you know, he changed, he changed a lot of our lives. And he changed, you know, how Irish rugby is. And... You know the respect it has now, and you know a lot of it is to thanks to him. Yeah, I think as the nineteen World Cup drifts into the past, his bigger body of work mm. returns to the fore, and we'll never have a period like that. Potentially, you know, he was just that good. Mm. Um, last point. So, like, geez, in the book, if Munster fans are wondering, you talk about the Munster years and the various coaches and all that stuff is in the book. There, just one uh, to finish on family. Because you've mentioned Idel, I don't know how many times. So obviously she's a bit of a hero in the book. I think a brief word on LMA, if you don't mind, without um, being unfair in her privacy. But she was diagnosed with PCD, similar to cystic fibrosis, born in 2012. Absolute nightmare for you guys. Uh, she seems to have taken to like probably a tough daily physio routine and lungs clogged up and every reason to feel sorry for herself and a bit of a hero in her own right as well. Yeah, she is. She's 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 been a superstar, you know. Um, I know every every parent is going to speak about their their child like that. But yeah, LMA was born with this respiratory condition. You know, thankfully the the community nurse who comes out and checks on parents when the baby is born noticed that you know she was coughing at four days old, which is which which isn't right. So. You know, the stories in the book, you know, went and got her, her checked out and, you know, finally got a diagnosis and, you know, yeah, LMA goes through physio, you know, a minimum of, of twice a day. Sometimes it's three or four times a day, you know, to get up her, her mucus and her, res, her respiratory, um, you know, clearing out her respiratory tract and, yeah, she hasn't complained. I, I suppose she does. She doesn't know any different either. You know, um, she's doing it. So we've been doing it since she's been, you know, a week old when we finally got the the diagnosis. You know, mm. she's she's been unbelievable. You know, and you know the pandemic at the start was quite worrying because we didn't know what what COVID was, and you know my paranoia did kick in and my fear did did kick in for her, but. You no, know, she she's got um her specialist um Dr. Barry Lanan has has looked after her unbelievably well in in the regional hospital in Limerick. You know he's he's one of the top respiratory doctors in the country, and thankfully we have him on our, our doorstep. Great. Listen, I've taken up enough of your time. We've only scratched the surface of this book. Like people really should get out there and read it themselves, and um, it's a great read and. Tommy Conlon's worked on it with you. So again, it's Keith Earls, it's fight or flight. That's it there. And listen, continued success, amazing career. We didn't know the half of it. <laughs> it turns out, Jesus, we didn't know the half of it. So look, um, you'll probably be playing until you're 40 at this rate. So best of luck over the next couple of years. And Keith Earls, thanks so much. Seriously, appreciate it. Sure, appreciate it.